and um, speakers. Um, we have the luxury of, of funding speakers through a special fund. And uh, in the 1977 yearly meeting minutes, the board reported that they had met with the Haynes family who had started and sponsored the Haynes Memorial Peace Lecture Fund to tell them that they deeply appreciated their efforts. Then the, the committee decided that they had received $3,000 from the estate of Ethel Fairley, and that would be added to the Peace Fund. And then 1978 and 79, another $1,000 was contributed by Luther and Soretta Warren. And so that would, back in 1977, was about $4,200. And today, I think if I read the figures right, we have over $8,000 in that fund. So uh, that's a good thing. Well, um, Every year, uh, our committee you know, tries to find a good speaker for this uh, program. And usually we get speakers about different issues happening in the world or officers of Quaker groups. And, uh, but we thought this year it would be interesting to uh, hear about peace from a literary viewpoint. So hopefully Sharon Rath will fill us in on the origin of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, what the process is of selecting winners, meaningful authors she has met, how her organization advances peace through literature. She can talk about whatever she wants to. <laughs> and uh, she brought along a friend, uh, Logan Young, and she'll tell you more about her. Uh, this is Sharon Honecker Rabb. She's a writer and educator and the founder of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, an international award known throughout the world for advancing peace through literature. She was born and reared, she was born in Dayton and reared in Fairborn. She earned her BA in English at Miami University and a Master of Education in Curriculum and Supervision at Wright State University. Sharon taught English at both Kettering Fairmont High School and Miami University, Oxford, and created graduate classes in writing and art for teachers in many states. For many years, Sharon also served as the education director for the Muse Machine and Arts Education Program for students throughout the Miami Valley. For 20 years, she produced and hosted Writer to Writer, a cable television show, which she interviewed hundreds of local, national, and international authors. Sharon was inducted into the Chester Roush Educational Hall of Fame, the Montgomery County Public Education Academy of Excellence, and the Fairborn Hall of Fame. She has served on numerous local, state, and national boards in the areas of arts, literature, and education and currently serves on the Wright State Foundation Board. She was asked to give a TEDx talk in 2012, Words Matter. In 2007, she was named one of the top 10 women in Dayton. In 2018, a YWCA Woman of Influence. And in 2015, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters by Wright State University. In 2019, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize won the Governor's Irma Lazarus Award in the Arts for being the arts organization that brings the most national and international attention to Ohio. Recently widowed, Sharon lives in Oakwood with her two dogs, Cosette and Mr. Darcy. <laughs> uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, she will be speaking. The title of her talk is Enlightenment, Empathy, Justice, Literature's Path to Peace. So, well, thank you, Mary. 
thanks to Marianne and thanks to all of you and your whole rest family and who are here. And if any of you have questions uh, later on, uh, Dee and Fred Rask have been to the Peace Prize many, many times. So you have sort of a homegrown expert um, if you have questions about things. And Kristen, it's going to be good talking to you wherever you are. <laughs> um, Kristen, if you want to bring up that first slide. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Um, we're here. And I certainly appreciate being invited here. I was very touched and, and happy to be here this evening. Um, Kristen, next slide. Okay, I'm going to read this to you. This comes from, uh, because I know it's pretty small, uh, this comes from Joanne Tompkins. We ask each of our authors to give a, a reflection on peace and writing and what they see as the connection between peace and writing. And we published that in our um, annual program. And it's an amazing collection of quotes. Joanne Tompkins uh, wrote, she was our uh, fiction runner-up last year, and she wrote a book called What Comes After, which Marianne told me in the book club here uh, recently read. She appeared uh, last year um, at, in Dayton, and she also gave talks at the University of Dayton um, and other places while she was here. She's an amazing person. She's not a Quaker herself, but she, she, I want to say this. She respects the fact that Quakers can resolve tensions, and she wanted to see how that worked. And so she went and stayed with some Quakers in Pennsylvania for several months and, and um, went to meeting with them and watched their process. And in, in that book, I think you'd enjoy that book, uh, What Comes After, because it is steeped in. in the power of, of and it's power a word that you use with Quakers. <laughs> anyway, the possibilities that, that the Quaker system brings. So this is the quote that she wrote for us, and it's lengthy, uh, but I think it's appropriate to start. Peace, or lack of peace, begins in the heart of each individual. If we cannot be at peace ourselves, how can we be at peace with our families, our neighborhoods, our workplaces. If we cannot forgive those we love and hold with affection, how will we ever open our hearts to those we dismiss as enemy or fail to see as fully human? Perhaps the greatest question of our lives is how do we as individuals grow our hearts in peace and in love? How do we loosen the constrictions of grievance and resentment? How do we free ourselves from our biases and distortions of perce perception so that we may see more clearly, so that we may create more peace in this world? Deeply drawn characters arouse curiosity in us, allow us to look beyond surface differences, beyond the labels we reflexively impose, and in doing so, we invariably come face to face with ourselves. I cut this in out to get it on the slide. We discover that we are not alone in our struggle to forgive, to love, to reconnect with life after loss and betrayal, and that we are all, at some level, seeking peace in our lives. This is what literature offers, a place to locate in others, no matter how unfamiliar the characters, habits, or attitudes, or life situations. The same heart that beats in us, one that longs to be seen, to be part of a larger community, to love and be loved. And it is this understanding of our shared heart, our one shared life, where peace can be found. Joanna Tompkins, author of What Comes After. Uh, Kristen's slide, please. Kristen? Okay, I think you missed one, maybe. Yes, there we go. Okay, the mission of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize is simply uh, stated and, and elegantly simple. Um, we want to advance peace through literature. And as we take a look at what we do every year, if, if it fits with this, it 
is in our wheelhouse. If it does not, it's not. So um, we move forward with that. Kristen, the goal of the Daytoner Peace Prize is to advance peace by supporting those who write, those who publish, those who read and share works about peace. Kristen. And our award is a little different than most uh, best book awards. Um, when people see our final lists, our list of finalists, sometimes they go, oh, I love that one more than the one that won. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, yes, but we have a dual purpose. It is a literary prize and it is a peace prize. If it's a beautifully written book that does not address our definition of peace, it's not going to win. If, it's, if it addresses peace, but it's poorly written, it's not going to win. What we are looking for is that dual, well, I was gonna say power again. Um, yeah. how <laughs> that dual truth of, of both the literary and, and the peace pull. Kristen? This is the criteria uh, for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize because I know people will want to see it. Our, our definition of peace is pretty broad. It addresses the subject of peace broadly, defined as increasing harmony and understanding between and among people. Peace may be addressed as it applies to individuals. And Joanne Tompkins' book is at that level. Um, families, communities, nations, ethnic groups, cultures, and religions. Kristen, it has evident literary value. When our judges, and I'll explain that process um, in a minute, go through this, they want to see, and I, okay, I taught English for 47 years, <laughs> and so I created rubrics and response forms, and they have to fill these things out. And then they, they determine, does this have the literary value that's going to carry uh, the, 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 that will um, win this prize. Kristen? It needs to apply to a variety of audiences. If you have a fine work that someone has uh, written and it might be published by, say, a university press somewhere, it could be for academics. You know, it could be a very narrow, it could be, it could be beautifully written, it could be about peace, but it could be so technical that the audience is not going to be able to connect with the book. Kristen, and then it has the potential to endure the test of time. Now we have no way of doing that, but our first readers um, are expert enough that uh, they have read widely and well. Many of them are professors. Um, they have a sense of what's going to perhaps last so we can't guarantee this, but it's something that we look for as a potential of a prize. Kristen, just so I want to give you some statistics because statistics tell their own story. And these are some of the questions that come up anyway. So I thought we'll just get through this. Oh, we have over 294 publishing houses that have nominated to date for the Date Literary Peace Prize, which I am very proud of. We're 18 years old, which is not very, old in the peace or in the literary prize world. So we're doing very well. We have, uh, and so sometimes it's the publishing house that sends us a book. Uh, in fact, most of them come from the publishing houses. Then we have a nominating academy also that's made up of former winners, former judges, independent bookstore owners. We have a university consortium, um, Wilmington is part of that and editors of magazines and newspapers. And then we also um, take nominations from any interested public that would include all of you, uh, librarians, book clubs, writers. I have all kinds of people that come up to me, sometimes at the grocery store, and uh, want to talk about a book that they've read that they think we ought to take a look at. And so once, once they come from the nominating academy or the interested public, I go back to the uh, publishing house, and I say, this book has been nominated by our nominating academy. You need to think about nominating it for the prize. It's a hundred dollars to nominate. Um, that pays for our first readers, and um, um, 
It, we also ask them to send copies of the books. So it's good for that writer to have the background uh, and the back backdrop of, of coming from the media uh, publishing house. So they pass it. Yeah. Kristen, here's some by the numbers things that'll help to give you some background. The first event was in 2006, and people ask me how it came about. I was on the board uh, that presented the Dayton Peace Prize. And the Dayton Peace Prize had been given to uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, George Soros, Bill Clinton, and then uh, Richard Holbrook. And I was on the board when we gave the prize to, to Richard Holbrook. And I'm sure, well, I'm not sure. I think Quaker meetings are a little different. Um, but if you've been outside Quakerland uh, to go to a meeting, you have probably um, sat through meetings where you've been in that same meeting about 15 times and you're wondering why you're all having it again. Um, because they, 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 you know, nothing has changed and you think, okay, this is the same agenda we've had for years. And I was getting that sense of, um, I was getting that sense of the, the committee being, or the board being in that place. And so I had had this television show that uh, Marianne mentioned and people, I would always ask them because I have some very, very, very famous authors, Jeremy Brooks and Chang Lee and um, uh, Lee Child and uh, Michael Crichton and, you know, I mean, uh, just a gamut of, of authors that I interview. And I say, why are you in Dayton? Why are you in Dayton? And uh, they'd always report uh, this. They'd say, Dayton and the Miami Valley is a reading community. They said, when we come here, we know people will have read our books. We know we're going to get great questions. And so I had that. As a teacher, I had seen literature change lives. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I have on several occasions seen literature save lives. And so I knew that there was power, and there it is again, uh, in that, um, in, in the written word to change the person. I guess it's a leap to think it can change the world, but I don't think it's that big a leap. Um, so I suggested that we do a literary peace prize. And they did what many, many com committees do. They said, good idea, Sharon, you just go right ahead and do that. <laughs> <laughs> And so I did, and uh, some of them followed me, and some of them did not. And we didn't any of us leave that organization. We just began a new one, and um, uh, it was uh, successful from the first year. It, it just amazed me. It just amazed me. The uh, community embraced the prize. The prize winners embraced the community, and the rest has been history. So far, we've honored up to, not including this year, 88 authors. Um, of those, 30 are uh, were born outside the United States. Uh, they, they came from 22 countries. And the authors so far come from 27 different states. I, I don't do one for statistics. I make all kinds of lists. Um, publishing houses, uh, 294. International publishers, and I'm very proud of this. Um, there are 53 publishers that don't have a US uh, counterpoint. University publishers are 50, I'll show you in a minute. First readers this year, we had 89 of them stretched all across the country uh, from their 20s to their 80s, uh, from the left to the right, from peace activists to we've got a retired general, we've got a special ops guy, we've got a We've got a colonel. I mean, you know, we we cover many many people. We've got two ministers. I mean, it, it, it's a real smattering of of a variety of people. We had 186 books nominated this year, and the total number of books we've had ever nominated are 1725. <laughs> Kristen, next slide. These I just wanted you to see. These are the university publishing houses. A number of them are in um, outside of the United States, Hungary, Scotland, Qatar, Malaysia. I mean, you can see England, uh, Canada, um, Guam. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me that even the university presses are sending books from 
outside the country. And even though I made that comment about university publishers maybe doing academic work, they also pick up a lot of books that the big publishers don't have the guts to pick up because they might not make them money. And so we get, we've had some wonderful winners from the University of Publishing Houses, which is why I emphasize that. Kristen? Our judging process, we have, as I mentioned, 89 first readers from throughout the United States. They're each given six books. They've sent six books. They're in teams of three. They don't know who else is on their team. They do all this homework that I sent to them. They send it back to me. And <laughs> Logan, Logan came over as we were leaving. She goes, what are those binders? And one of them is like this thick and the other one's this thick. I said, oh, those are the first reader responses. And she goes, do you read them? <laughs> and I, I do. Um, and so they're each given the six books. And uh, once I get numbers and I read the comments, then we determine uh, that six go on in fiction. And I know I just told that five, but um, and six go on in nonfiction. And then I have four final judges, and we rotate our final judges every two years. So um, the current judges, uh, we've had two in fiction and two in nonfiction. They work completely independently. The two genres work completely independently. Um, John Parrish Petey, he's the um, he's the immediate uh, past president of the National Humanities uh, National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington. And prior to that, he was the head of uh, the literary grants for the National Endowment for the Arts. He's teaching <laughs> right now this year in Missouri. Lisa Page is a beautiful black woman. She teaches at Georgetown. She um, Georgetown, and she's married to Clarence Page, the um, the uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. In nonfiction, we have Peter Hodavis. He's the um, an award winning author. Um, he's half Welsh, half Chinese. And he um, he teaches up at Michigan. And then Lou Ann Walker has been an editor for the New York Times um, and the Washington Post. She she has created her own journal and she teaches at Stony Brook. So that's the caliber of, of judges that we have at the top. And they have to decide. Several times they've come and they've said, we can't decide. And I, I'll say, this is a peace prize. <laughs> We're going to decide. <laughs> and we did. So, so thank you, Kristen. We give five awards fiction, um, 10,000 fiction runner up, 5,000 same in nonfiction. And then the ambassador, Richard C. Holbrook, Distinguished Achievement Award is 10,000. And we have that as our Lifetime Achievement Award first. But after Richard tragically died in 2010, we renamed the award for him. I, I asked his widow if we could do that, and she very generously said yes. Kristen? Uh, this is when he won the Dayton Literary uh, Dayton Peace Prize. And that was in 2005. See that bald head in the middle? That is my late husband, and I'm just to his right. And, um, Richard looked at the crowd and he said, he said, the thing that David needs to do is to celebrate peace every year. I had already designed the whole program and I just went, I think I just got a blessing. <laughs> I think I just got a blessing. And so that's why it seems so fitting. Kristen? This is Kati Martin. Um, this is his wife, and uh, she's a writer. She's Hungarian. Um, she's a writer. She was previously married to Peter Jennings, mm -hmm. and her children are from Peter Jennings. And then, um, then um, uh, Richard Holbrook broke up with Diane Sawyer. <laughs> and, uh, so we have quite quite a few stories. <laughs> okay, she's lovely, and she often comes and presents the uh, the Richard Holbrook Award. So she's a dear friend of the prize. Kristen? And we have seal because on the books, and um, it's, what I loved most is when they begin to print the seal on the books, you know, when they do the, um, 
And so I hope you get to see that on some of us. Kristen. This is a little out of date. I haven't um, changed the slide on the, this, I should have, but it gives you a sense the country is of origin, and this is about two years old. There are some additional ones, especially in South America. Kristen. And the settings for the books, that's important too. And this, again, is dated, and this has been expanded. But when you take a look at the, uh, the coverage that we now have, and these are just our winning and, and runner up books, just to include our finalists. I mean, we're, we've done a good job of, of taking the reader out of um, their comfort zone and, and taking them around the world. Kristen? Um, we don't, we have a, almost 1,500 followers. The important part is they're from 47 countries and they're in 22 languages. Mm -hmm. I find that pretty remarkable uh, that they follow us. Interestingly, to me at least, um, US is first. Afghanistan a second. Now explain that to me. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yes, sir. What is a follower? It's someone who follows our Facebook page and, and reads all of our the things that we put out and they're they're translated into all these languages. So they're they're keeping in touch with the Day Wonder Peace Prize. And I'm hoping it's not the Taliban. You know. <laughs> Kristen? Okay, we have a book club and you're all invited to join anytime you want. It's it's pretty interesting. We have 95 members from throughout Ohio, Arizona, California, Colorado, Maryland, New York, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Washington State, Logan's a member. Our moderator is Ron Rollins. He's a very well-read English major. Uh, he's a former editor of Ideas and Voices, the Daily News, and he keeps things moving. We read current and past winners, runners up, finalists in fiction and nonfiction, and the Holbrook winner. And our program manager, Emily, would be glad to put you on the list if you have any interest in It's not something you have to come to all the time with 95 people. It's a Zoom. It's a Zoom. And um, it lasts for an hour to an hour and a half, depending on uh, how many questions there are from from the audience, so it's, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. Kristen, this, the next one is coming right up. It's August 2nd, and it's Andrew Karak, um, Like the Appearance of Forces. This is the third book that he has in his um, trilogy of books that he has written about war, which I know is probably not your favorite topic, but I think you'd be very interested in Andrew. Um, he he studied to be a Jesuit, and uh, he speaks and writes ancient Greek and Latin, and he knows Russian and Czech and Spanish and French and Italian, and he's a beautiful writer in English. I mean, he he is an American, um, and he is the gentlest soul, the gentlest soul, and this is a this would be a wonderful discussion, and this is his. Um, newest book I, I went to its launch in um, at Harvard uh, in uh, June and oh he's just an amazing amazing speaker and writer Kristen so y'all come <laughs> um there's an author series uh October 19th and you're all invited to this too only well, this one I have paid to back to um and he Brad Kessler, a writer up in Vermont, is in conversation on his book, The North. It's a new book last year. And uh, it's about a Somalian refugee who is trying to get to Canada because she's been rejected. Uh, her, her pleas for immigration have been rejected by the United States. And they're, um, the setting it is a monastery. I think you'd be very interested in this. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And, and Brad is an elegant writer. Kristen, um, when you say you all come, is this Zoom or in location? When you no, say, that's it, no, it's uh, meetings. That's that's going to be in person in Dayton, and I don't have the place to tell you yet. Yeah, but so these are at, at a location. Gotcha. The book club is Zoom, right? The the author series is in Dayton. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and now this one also is obviously in Dayton. It's November 11th. And I'm going to give each of you a uh, program from last year, but being the teacher I am, I'm not going to give them to you until I'm finished talking. <laughs> Um, so, um, anyway, this is just the Saturday program and, uh, it'll show you what we do there. And, uh, the, the, the tickets range from $20 to 150, I think. And you can just call the Victoria and, um, sign up. And it's a, it's a lovely afternoon. Dean and Fred have been there too, so you can think. Um, I, I brought two of uh, the books from the gala i'll show you how different these are um this is last year's program from the gala it's a much it's a much more sophisticated piece i'll leave two of them here marianne and you can see who who might be interested in, in taking a look all of those reflections that i talked about are right in the middle of the book but okay so and they're just so beautifully written i think you love them um, these are $30 a piece, so I can see them up there. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, okay. Uh, this is, this is well worth it. And it's in the afternoon, so you don't have to drive home at night. Okay, Kristen? Oh, Kristen, can you, yeah, make it. This is what the gist of this is. Yeah, I think if you just hit the forward button, it will go. I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try the icon. Yeah, that might work. I was working on an app, Apple, when I did this. Yeah, see if that does it. Okay, just forward ahead. What I what I do, that's just a little graphic about the floor. It's an open book, and then first enlightenment comes out, then empathy comes out, then justice comes out, then peace comes out. We should be broke. Okay. Um, and that's I've been thinking about this for a long, long time. What does what is that connection between literature and peace? I have many, many, many author statements that have, that have convinced me that the, the connection is absolutely there. I have 47 years of watching it happen in action. I have friends and book clubs all over the place. I know that this works, but I tried to break down, okay, what is that process? And I think I think the first thing that comes is this enlightenment. You just you, you become aware. Heaven forbid I use the word woke. You know, <laughs> um, the, um, you become you become uh, you become a different person in one sense, and then that something is being presented to you that has challenged what you thought you knew um, or what you just didn't know, and. Um, this is Clint Smith. He's a wonderful writer. He won the Pulitzer with this book, How the Word Is Passed. He was our fiction winner, or our nonfiction winner last year. Without an accurate sense of history, there can be no sense of peace. We must engage rigorously with the past in order to accurately understand the landscape of contemporary inequality. Without shared understanding, shared understanding, Ding, Sharon, typewriter. Of what came before us, we will continue to see fissures that break us farther apart. Now, he lives in, he's from New Orleans, Clint. And so, my husband and I, our last trip uh, just before he died was down in Mississippi. I highly recommend this if you're into rock and roll and all. Um, <laughs> we went from Memphis down to New Orleans, following the history of rock and roll and down through Cajun country. But we also took, a, I was a bike trip. And we also took a lot of side trips um, to uh, some of the historic places. And when we were in Memphis, 
I was thinking, oh, this is going to be good. I wonder how Clint is going to be thinking about it here because what he did in the word is past. He went to a number of of uh, historic places in the United States, nine of them, and he took a look at how they were presenting the information of, that included slavery and what they were saying about the past, or if it was just the glorification of what this place was, and, and the, the white story. He wondered if the black story was going to be involved. And so as the bus takes off from the ship and we stop at our first place, I was delighted to see that it was a monument to um, the Memphis uh, Blacks who had had uh, sort of uh, had a mini revolution um, and had asserted their rights in uh, in town. And the, the speaker, the guide was white, but she did a beautiful job. So I'm over here texting Clint, you're okay in Memphis? <laughs> you know? But I guess we went down and we got into Natchez and things down in Natchez weren't like they were in Memphis. <laughs> uh, I said, but you've got work to do in Natchez, you know. Um, but the it, it's it was a very, very interesting trip having read that book. Kristen. Um, here are some other books, and I just want to show you the variety. R.B. wrote Cullen Murphy. He was um, uh, an, a, an amazing editor, and he he wrote, he won, I think, 2009, something like that. He was a runner-up, um, and uh, he compared the United States to Rome then, you know, I think. I wonder what you write right now. And um, we also have these academic things like the Oxford International Encyclopedia of Peace. I don't know if you have that in your library, Marianne. It's four huge volumes. And and Nigel has taken the history of peace internationally and has defined it's an encyclopedia. It's pretty interesting. If your library doesn't, that would be one of the books. <laughs> You know, the huge. There's a grant where any library can get a thousand dollars a year. And this doesn't come from us; it comes from the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Any library, school, public, college, mm -hmm. can get a thousand dollars a year to buy books from the Dayton Library Peace Press. Oh. You just have this tiny, 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 easy, easy, easy mm -hmm. grant to fill out. It's simple. Thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Shockwave, uh, Stephen Walker. He was, I'm laughing. I can't say, say his name without laughing. Um, he, wrote, he won um, a nonfiction award the first year. The reason I'm la laughing, he, he lives in England. He's red. So we were international from the first year. And so you can only imagine, okay, I called his publisher and I said, uh, Stephen just won the Dayton Larry Peace Prize. I know. And I said, yes, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really good. He, he won the Dayton Larry's Peace Prize, and I need to get in touch with him. So she gives me his cell number. So he says, she said, well, he's in France right now. Um, he's in the uh, South of France traveling with his family. So I call. He didn't even know he was dominated. Anyway, I call. Um, See, so, you know, this is Sharon Rab. I'm calling from Dayton, Ohio, and you have won the Dayton Larry Peace Prize. I could hear the wind. It's fresh. I'm going, Stephen. It's a Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and it's a new prize. It's a new prize, but it it shows that you connected with peace in some way, and there's still just yes, he says. <laughs> and then I finally just said, "If you come to Dayton, Ohio, I'll give you ten thousand dollars." He says, "Okay." <laughs> Um, and he did, he loved it, he had a great time. Um, Bias by Jennifer Everhart. She's an Ohio one, by the way, she's from Cleveland. And she won a uh, nomination. Uh, what? She was a runner. Um, in, uh, I don't know when, probably 2019, 2019. Uh, Bias. It, it, that's a, it's a great book. It's a, it's it's sort of uh, how do I want to say academic in a sense. It's really lots of statistics, but boy, does she prove how our lives is created and when it is created. 
and how what it is and how we carry it around and how we're unaware of it. And it makes you far more aware of your own bias. Kristen. Empathy. Empathy is so big and in, in, it's probably the most important key to all of this. As the writers uh, create their reflections, one after another, after another, after another, talks about empathy, 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 empathy. And so I started studying this and I put four uh, quick uh, studies up there where they've done scientific studies that empathy comes from literary quality literature. And it's true for children and it's true for adults. And so, I mean, they have actually proven <laughs> the connection of these two things. Um, Kristen? Uh, this is from Margaret Atwood, uh, just one of the most delightful people I've ever met, ever, ever, ever met. The first thing she did when I picked her up at the airport is, oh my God, I'll to help her with her one inch, she went like this to me. And I thought, what is she doing? <laughs> and she says, I'm giving you a Vulcan blessing, I think you're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, if fiction presents its characters in the round, what they think, what they feel, whom they love and fear, it's impossible not to realize that those being read about are as human as those doing the reading. And if the characters from other places or other cultures, it becomes less and less possible to dismiss such people as not like us, and therefore not our fellow mortals. Writers are limited in their range and what they're able to write about, whereas readers are not. Readers can read across the whole sweep of human experience, as far back in the past as they can see, as far afield as they can reach, as far into the future as it is, as it is possible to imagine. The closer we are to a person, the psychiatrist tells us, the harder it is to murder them. <laughs> Perhaps that is the way in which reading is conducive to peace. It brings us closer together. If I feel I know you, understand you, and like you, why would I wish to make more on you? She's some. She's some. Next, Kristen. Uh, four, and um, a prayer for Owen Meany. You might not realize this, um, but John Irving, in his speech and in his reflection, wrote that his purpose in writing is to make people understand those with sexual proclivities that are not considered normal by the standard um, reader. And that runs across his literature. I love Shark John Irving, or I have read, I think everything he's ever written. And while that is certainly true in his books, I would never pick that out as the main theme. And that's what he sees as the main theme. Yeah. It's interesting, interesting. The Mountain Sing, for my when. Um, this is a very interesting book. She is from North Vietnam. Um, the Mountain Sing is the Vietnam War told from a female North Vietnamese point of view. It's the first time we've heard that particular voice. And so you, you get a whole different perspective on that. Edwidge Danikan is from uh, Haiti. Um, the title of the book, Brother I'm Dying, pretty much tells you the story. Her family um, immigrated from Haiti and this was her uncle writing to her father as he was trying to get over the endless hurdles to get into the United States any other way. What we owe, oh, David Wood is a, he is a, um, a Quaker. I love David Wood. But if you can imagine, if you can imagine, he's a Quaker who is embedded, he's a journalist. He was embedded with the forces in both Afghanistan and Iraq. 
and he saw he was under fire often. When he he he, he followed these men and women that he was with, as you can only imagine, uh, being a Quaker with such sympathies, and um, he determined he determined that. Um, he, he followed them once he got home as well, kept touching base with them. And he was seeing too, too many suicides. He was seeing too many men and women in trouble, deep, deep trouble. And he attributes this um, briefly to the fact that they don't come home as a group. They, can't, they come home as individuals. There's no camaraderie. You know, they get on a plane uh, and it's a, you know, dull time. And they come home and there's nobody there. There's nobody there. Um, they don't have a, a, a cohort to be talking about the war with, and they're often redeployed really quickly. So there's not that, okay, the war is over, I'm leaving it. It's, oh, now I'm back in it. So there are these very short periods of time. And he says PTSD doesn't begin to describe what is true of these people. He calls it a moral injury. And he says it's a moral injury because they have been forced or they just do something that has gone against everything that their church told them, that their schools told them, that their families told them, that their community told them. And they've been asked to do this in the name of the Father. And so I have brought with me one of my favorite people in the world, Logan Young who knows David well and who helped whenever we gave presentations because we did presentations uh, for kids in high school. That's part of our author series. And I can talk about that later if we have time. But we bring, just quickly, Wilmington, does, Wilmington comes to this. Um, every year we bring one of our authors back. We have a panel for kids and uh, there are 17, there are 17 um schools literally actually I think now we're up to 21 schools that come to Kettering and Fairmont. They have books signed, they get to talk to the author, there's a presentation, it's pretty wonderful. So um Logan knows David well. She also served in Afghanistan. I'm going to let her talk to you about that and she helped him present when uh they came to Fairmont. So this is Logan Matt. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll try to give you a brief history. So uh, I was I joined the Army when I was 21, and I went to basic training and then AIP, got my first duty station, and then deployed. Um, I had a young son at the time. He was around three or four, um, and I had actually met my husband at the recruiting station, so he's in basic training while I'm deploying. And so... Um, I deploy. I was in Afghanistan for a year. I was a convoy driver. I was the lead convoy driver. And um, it was, this was 2009 or 2010 to 2011. This is when our deployment was. We were in Kabul, Afghanistan. And um, I earned a combat action badge while I was there because we encountered and engaged with the enemy. We had um, a V bed, which is a vehicle. Uh, explosion, explosion device uh, that went, went off at our gate. And so we pushed back. I drove my truck into the gate as a barricade so that no other um, Taliban or, or whatever could uh, infiltrate the base while we were there. And so we held them off and um, we had no casualties. Um, they, they did, unfortunately. Um, but we had no casualties and we came back to our base that day and we have a chaplain say, Is everyone good? They, Yep, and they say, okay, get back out on the road. And so that was it. That's all we ever thought of that. And then we had another encounter where we were coming home um, through the gates, uh, home with our pop, not home America. <laughs> so we were coming home from the convoy one day and uh, we had another v bed that went off as we were coming in, another convoy was coming out. So the attacker was trying to get both of us. And um, so he uh, ended up being the only casualty as well that day. Um, and But we had to block off the area and we had to um, keep his car and his body um, protected in a sense, preserved for um, investigators to come out and for us to do an assessment. And Chapman didn't even come that time. Uh, so then we returned home uh, from Afghanistan. And um, so 
we came home on July 4th and we were just, you know, um, doing our jobs and preparing to come home. So there was no um, transition. We came straight home that night at midnight. Our families and our kids were there to welcome us. And me and my husband actually flew home together. He ended up deploying midway through as well and joined me on the deployment. So um, it's midnight, July 4th, and uh, my son was about five at the time. My mom and my grandmother run up to me and start hugging me. And I just kind of did like this. And they looked at me really weird. And I kind of pushed my son back as a response. And he looked at me and started crying. And my mom started yelling at me like, why would you push your son? You know? And it was a lot. So, uh, you know, I didn't think anything of it. It was just a response. So then fast forward um, about, I want to say five years after I'd been out and moved back to Ohio. And um, you know, my husband um, had another son and then we had another son two years later. So I think it's been about seven years since I've been out by this time. I started right stay, I was going to school. And when I was pregnant with the middle son, this was 2015, 2014, um, I got out in 2012. 2013, um, I was in a psychology class and I was talking about my deployment and I now know I was having an anxiety attack or panic attack telling something that had happened and I told my husband, that was weird, I kind of had like hormonal things. And so over the years, I started having these little odd instances that I had never experienced. And so on that break day, it was 2019, I think. And uh, my boss, Dr. Gordon, at Wright State of the Veteran Military Center says, um, there's this Dave Leonard Peace Prize. They need a veteran that's a speaker. You're going to be a speaker. And uh, I said, okay, what am I going to talk about? She said, war. And you're going to read this book, and then you're just going to talk about your experience. I'm like, okay, easy peasy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I read David Wood's book, and I listened to it on audiobook. And I think I read it within a week, and I couldn't stop crying. I just was a mess. I was really agitated. I was hysterical. I just, I kind of recluse and couldn't figure out. I was like, well, that was weird. Hormones, <laughs> right? You know, because I had all these kids. So um, then in a month after I read this book, I have to do a talk with David. And he's on Zoom. We're at the library in Dayton, the Dayton Metro Library. And I'm on stage with another veteran friend of mine. And we're David is asking us questions, the moderator is asking us questions, we're talking about our experiences with moral injury. In reading David's book, I realized I have moral injury, and among other things, and that war had an impact on me, that I, I thought I was fine, I was unscathed, or didn't save me. But come to find out, especially with children, um, there's multiple times I aimed my gun at a child. There was one time where I forcefully pushed a child with my gun because he was trying to reach into my pocket. So that's what the kids there do. And, but they can be planting bombs on you or they can be searching your pockets for candy, but that's a risk you can't take. So I shove a child, you know, with my gun, pointed at him, say some explicit words, and which was the response I was giving my son when I came home from Afghanistan. And I didn't have a weapon on me at the time, but I was, you know, pushed him and I'm waiting to feel something that isn't there. So David Wood's book changed my life for the better. Um, it helped point out something I didn't even know existed. It brought something that I could relate to. I could feel something was off, but I couldn't figure out why or what was happening and something's wrong with me. I'm the only person experiencing this. And David Wood's book, I just joked to him, I'm like, thanks a lot. You really opened a can of worms there. You put me in therapy. I don't know. Um, but it, it showed me what I was dealing with. And when I came home, unlike a lot of other veterans, I wasn't angry or fearful of Muslim people. I was extremely empathetic. I would almost cry every time I see a Muslim person or if I heard somebody from the Middle East or, and then I find myself like craving, um, we would eat food with the um, interpreters at Turk Village. So I would crave the food and the tea, and I just wanted to go back there so bad. I would read books about Afghanistan, I'd read stories, and I was just kind of obsessing. And I realized because my, my moral injury was so deep that all that country has ever wanted was peace. And we did, and they expected us to bring peace. Our mission was Operation Enduring Freedom. 
And we didn't do that at all. We didn't bring any peace. We brought more violence and assertiveness and the locals were very disappointed at that. And so there is such significance to reading and empathizing with an experience and applying it to either your real life or just having an understanding of what that person goes through or the day in their shoes. It, empathy is the epitome of reading literature about other cultures, experiences, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you'll want to talk to her. Um, Kristen, next. Justice, um, Brian Stevenson, if you know of him, of course, um, he is, is famous. Um, he's one of the most amazing speakers. By the way, all of our past winners and your speeches are on our website. If you want to go and hear any of them talk, he is amazing. 2015. Um, without justice, there could be no peace. Kristen. Uh, in the place of justice, the story of punishment and redemption, Wilbert Boudot actually did kill a person. He was then put in an Angola prison when he was 19. He stayed there for 44 years. When he entered Angola prison, he could not read and he could not write. He taught himself to read and he began to write. He has, he, he started the Ang Angolite, the newspaper while he was in Angola, Angola, and it began to win awards. It won, it won three consecutive uh, national awards. Um, he then started making films inside the prison. He's won two Emmys before he was released. He was finally released after 44 years, which was much longer than any teenager who had committed murder had ever served. Um, in Angola, and I think you know that Angola is the worst of any prison um, in America. He is an amazing man. Um, I have I have asked him to appear. Uh, we did a, a presentation in Tulane, and he came and talked to the students and the faculty at Tulane, and they were just they were just blown away by him. Another uh, way to take a look at justice, know my name, Chanel Miller. You may uh, remember that she was the woman who was raped at Stanford by a young man, and then um, he was convicted, but um, not really. Uh, and he he lives in, in Oakwood, which is where I live. And so when I asked her to come to Dayton, where her attacker was from. I thought, whoa, and she did. She did, and she was absolutely amazing and captivating for that crowd. The Roundhouse, if you know Louise Erdrich, she does a lot with Native American and, and um, um, non-Native American law as the two uh, struggle. Devil in the Grove, Thurgood National, and the Groveland Voice and the Donovan of America by Gilbert King. He's um, he's become the voice of the Dayton Larry Peace Prize, Pulitzer Prize winner. But the odd story about that is Devil in the Grove hadn't been selling well. He was out mowing his lawn and he got a call and they told him that his book was going into remainder. And if you know what that means, it means it's being taken off the shelves of bookstores and it's, it's being shipped back to the publisher or if, if there are copies that they'll put them in a bargain bin kind of thing. And he went back to mowing the grass and he told me he, he really started to cry. He was really upset because it was an important book to him. And the phone rang again and he thought, oh. <laughs> and it was totally one of the answer. <laughs> and he said, Get it. <laughs> so all those books that were being sent to remainders all of a sudden found their way back on the shelves. <laughs> so he has been, I don't know, he's the uh, he's got an outstanding um podcast. It was voted the best podcast in America last year, and it's called Bone Valley. And what he has done, I'll tell you, he got the Groveland voice for for 
young black men were accused of rape by a white woman, of course, had not done it. We, we have heard these stories all the time. And uh, there was a there was an evil sheriff in Orange County, Florida, and he shot three of them. Shot them. One of them survived. And Gilbert, as soon as he wrote this book, began to try to get these men exonerated, and he finally did. It took him years. He kept going back to Florida and back to Florida and back to Florida until he got them exonerated. Kristen? Uh, I don't know if you know Richard Powers. He's pretty amazing. He says it pretty simply. No justice, no peace. No kinship, no justice. No empathy, no kinship. Reading and writing are exercises in empathy. How would the urgencies of the world look and feel if I could get beyond myself? The best way to get beyond the self is a good story. No good stories, no peace. He wrote the oldest story about trees. Did you read that? That's fabulous book. Kristen. I put down the peaceful books. I don't know if you know Wendell Berry. He's a farmer down in uh, Kentucky. What a writer. What a writer. Poet reader. Essays. Um, he's got eight, eight novels, and uh, the the novels are called the Fort Williams series, and J. Bar Crowe was my favorite of those. I was honored to get to go to his home, and that's because he doesn't have a computer, so I couldn't communicate with him uh, unless I went and talked to him about coming for the prize, because he was on our Holbrook uh, one year. I, I went down to this farm. And it's a very, it's in Kentucky and the, the river would be behind me. And then you look up and you see these steep, 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 steep steps up to this old farmhouse. And my husband and I walk up there and we were panting by the time we got to the top. <laughs> you walk in and every single room that you see is floor to ceiling books, floor to ceiling books. It's a, a wonderment to me. I kept just looking at all the titles. No digital clock. Um, no, no phone. There's an old phone dial. Phone. <laughs> no computer. No computer. Uh -uh. And we had a lovely afternoon. We talked talk about the prize and what was expected of, of us. But my favorite, my very favorite part is as we were leaving, we were each handed a, a package of garbage to take down those steps. <laughs> And was at the bottom. <laughs> so, and then I looked back, and there were all these packages. I guess every visitor. These <laughs> the Gilead books by Marilyn Robinson, and that's Gilead. Gilead is a trilogy. Actually, it's more. It's four books now. Um, just the gentlest, most wonderful. Rising out of hatred. The Awakening of a Former White Nationalist, Eli Saslow, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And he followed a young man whose um, godfather was David Duke, whose father was the head of the most righteous of all the white nationalist groups. And the young man ended up going to the new school in Florida for. Yes. Um, and all of a sudden, some of his Jewish friends started asking him to come to Shabbat. And he didn't tell them who he was or what his association was. He was running the young white nationalists. That's what he was doing. And he had sort of infiltrated this liberal college. But his, his Jewish friends invited him to Shabbat. He did whatever they do in Shabbat. Um, then um, he, he fell in love with this girl and she began to try to turn him. Um, and he finally has become one of the proponents for um, one of the major proponents in the country for um, empathy toward blacks. That's a beautiful book. If you want to see a book where change actually has come about, Read that rising out of hatred, and then uh, almost a text nonviolence: the history of the dangerous idea. Mark Kermansky. 
and he follows 25 peacemakers throughout history and shows that, you know, they think of, you think of uh, peace as something that's soft and gentle, but it's really very, very, very dangerous. Kristen? Are we so naive as to think that we can bring peace to the world with words? Yes, we are. We live as well. Holocaust survivor and author of night. Kristen, I've got, um, try the next slide. Okay, that's Linda Sell, um, and you can see he won the second year. He, of course, unfortunately, is now deceased. Um, Kristen, I have a, a, I have another uh, image that I can um, motion picture. Maybe the little camera. We didn't try that before. Move down one more slide, and I'll see if we can get this to work. Yeah. Yeah, they're the one with the camera. See if the camera, yeah. Okay, try clicking on, try clicking on um, just the center of the image. Okay. Okay, that's not gonna work. Okay. Too bad I have, yeah, I have been saying that and I have a beautiful piece with Tim O'Brien um, later. And I can read you some of Tim O'Brien's words though. And then we're open to questions or you can run off and do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Tim won probably about two fifteen. Tim cried um, four times to spoken dating the week that he came. Um, and um, he cried every time that he talked. And I'll show you one if I can find him. By the way, he um, he is on our uh, Advisory council. He thinks that much of the cries. Oh, here we go. I've spent 35 years being called a war writer, and I'm not. The surface surface of my books may well be war, but the interior and the spirit of the books is about this yearning and craving and thirst for a world of peace. And uh, he's probably one of the most famous. War writers. I mean. So I've taken up so much time, but if you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. I was curious, but way back in one year, saw where you were showing the different locations of where the the um, stories took place or the writing took place. You had black and you had orange. Which was which? And most of my states were all. Oh, the dark. The dark was yeah. the, the ones that. Where where it's things happen. happen. Yeah. And okay. I was hoping that was for yeah. that was yeah, we're getting around. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Is there a certain time frame that the books have to be written in in order to be nominated? The previous year, like this year, we're taking a look at the 22 books. And we open nominations in January, they continue to mid-March. And then so if you have a book that you're reading this year that's contemporary 2023. We'd love to hear from you if you want to nominate it next year. Yes, sir. I imagine most of these books are perhaps more dramatic or serious, but are there any of the, the ones that you have worked with that one might describe as humorous? Yeah. Because there's nothing more devastating than humor. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and there are probably more when I look at the finalists, there are a lot more that are humorous. You know, they don't always tend to be winners. Orphan Master's Son, you have to be have a pretty warped sense of humor if you find it humorous, but it is. Um, and that's by uh, the uh, Adam Johnson, the um, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning. He, that won him the Pulitzer as well. 
Um, Louise can be funny. Uh, Margaret Atwood can be very funny. Um, uh, John Irving can be funny, um, depending on which book you're looking at. But it's his is a sardonic, ironic uh, level. But you know, so it's not oh, oh. Um, just appreciation of his his kind of irony in, in life. Um, let me think. Um, I may have exhausted it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm coming up blank for her anymore. But yeah, and Billy Lynn, like what? Billy Lynn. Oh, and Billy Lynn's I... long halftime walk. Thank you, yes. thank you. That's by Ben Fountain. And <laughs> see, I'm laughing. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's set. It's set at halftime at a game in Texas, and they bring a group of guys who have done something that the media has described as heroic. But in fact, one of their friends has died in this, and they—it's it, it, a horrible circumstance. And they have to fly back home with their friend's body right there in the plane with them, and they're looking at it. Where so they're sitting in those seats like that, and so they want—they want these guys to parade out at halftime of this football game so they can have a Texas, you know triumphant military thing well they've just been through hell um they're tired they got drunk the night before the, the football game as i think people do <laughs> <laughs> and um, um billy lynn has a headache and people keep saying thank you for your service thank you for your service what can we do and he says you can get me an aspirin <laughs> he gets his aspirin on the last page of the book, <laughs> but they make it go through so much, and they want to see Beyonce. She's performing at this halftime show, and they get them down there, and instead of treating them in any respectful way, they are clearly just using those props, and they can give a damn about these guys, and the guys know it. The guys know it. She knows Ben Fountain very well. Uh, could we take the PowerPoint down because there's friends on Zoom that uh, we can oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, Kristen, do you want to take the PowerPoint down? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, give me that part. <laughs> okay. Any and other then questions? I probably take the spotlight off. There you go. Thank you. Any other questions? I know we've kept you a long time. But, uh, oh, yes, sir. Um, has anybody studied the demographics of people who read peace literature? Um, you know, I've never come across any study. I have, I'll tell you, it's because we have professors as first readers all over the country, some of them have expressed an interest in, you know, that kind of research. I don't think anybody's done it. Why, you have some time on your hands? <laughs> He just retired. Yeah. This is the other Yes, Henrietta. Is it possible for you to give a list of all the books that you mentioned during your talk to the Wilmington Community Coordinator so she can forward it to us? Yeah. The, um, I've got I've got some things that I've given to Marianne uh, that could be sent to you too. But on our website, you can go to uh, DaveLeonardPeacePrize.org if you if you if you go online. And if so, all of the books, all the former winners and runners up are listed there. And this is on Facebook, right? It will be on our Facebook. Yeah, well, I, I don't know what the plans yeah, for the report. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's Facebook. So just go to Wilmington Area Meeting Facebook and you hear your presentation again. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a private one. <laughs>